The fight over dark money campaigns. Do we have a right to know who is donating? Plus, right to work turns one. And Dave Bing's true legacy. It is all coming up tonight on My Week. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We are glad that you're settling in with us tonight. There is a lot to get to. We're going to take a look at outgoing Detroit Mayor Dave Bing's legacy tonight. Plus, is Michigan any different one year after right to work? But we do start tonight with a fight over so-called dark money campaigns in Michigan. We all see the issue ads in an election year. Are we entitled to know who pays for them? A new campaign finance bill out of Lansing would keep donors' names private. And the fight is lining up on two sides, freedom of speech versus transparency and how could it affect the 2014 election year here in Michigan let's get started right there with our contributors Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press gentlemen how are you Merry Christmas well thank you very much right. and to both end of, of the you. year it's the, it, we're wrapping towards the end of the year <laughs> but it's still kind of busy in Lansing and the governor has to make a decision about this campaign finance bill what do you think he's going to do oh I think he signs the bill um, I don't think he's got uh, serious issues with the bill. Uh, I think it fits in with with established law, with Supreme Court rulings. I think, uh, you know, he's not going to, to fight with the legislature over this one. Should he have serious issues with this bill? And why does it come down to free speech versus transparency? Well, it doesn't come down to free speech versus transparency. That's all uh, a complete fiction uh, dreamed up by big money who wants to not say it's who supported they are. supported by the U.S. Supreme it's Court. It's not supported by the U.S. Supreme Court. What the U.S. Supreme Court said in that case was that in in a specific instance where donors had reason to fear uh, retribution against them for giving money in the in the case that everyone cites it's it's a civil rights organization it's the NAACP at a time when people were killing black people for standing up for their rights d do, do these corporate donors have that issue do they have well, that fear well and, and as we've seen in other places um, you have uh, interest groups taking these names of donors using it um, to to personally harass them, to, to boycott and attack their, it their, is not their companies. It's remotely I mean, the same thing. You should be able to participate in the political process without fear of that sort of retribution. You should, you should, but you should not be able to uh, participate in the political process anonymously unless you have an affirmative reason to... to, to uh, so, are, all right, no, so Steve, are unions, going to, are unions going to say, okay, here are all the people who contributed to our I, I think They, should, I think they the, don't. I think the rules should be... I think the rules should be the same across the board. They never do. But they never are. what the what the corporations don't want is any sort of disclosure at all of this this unbelievable mound of money that they are they are now right, stockpiling to put into elections. Let's back up. Why don't you give people an idea of how much of this money is actually being spent in Michigan and how it does impact them? Because it's I'm not quite sure huge. people realize how much money is going through here in election cycle based on these issue campaigns. Well, almost all of these numbers that you hear. Uh, about the upcoming campaigns, you know, let's say the Senate campaign or the, the gubernatorial campaign, include tens of millions of dollars in this, this, these third-party uh, contributions is, is what you call them. And so they are not supposedly being spent on behalf of a candidate. Uh, they are being spent by independent organizations that are uh, issue-oriented. Uh, but, of course, what we've seen over and over again is that these issue based organizations are aligned with candidates they are they are very much for one person or another so it's difficult to to sort of separate um, you know what what money is is independent and what money is aligned with a candidate what the supreme court did uh, uh, with this case a few years ago was sort of pull uh, pull all the stops out of that side of the equation so you can do it in an unlimited manner and not say at all uh, where you're getting the money 
All right, so this is passed in, in the legislature. The governor has to make mm -hmm. a decision. We have taped the show a little bit earlier, so we could have made a decision by the time that we, we um, hit the air. Why shouldn't the governor support this? Why should he veto this, Stephen? Well, I mean, he should he should send a message that says, look, we need to be much more transparent. This is a guy who ran, again, uh, talking very big about transparency and the idea of accountability. Uh, and and this bill doesn't assure that. This bill allows you to still cloak yourself uh, and uh, participate in the political process. It should mean something to him that that bill has that flaw. Uh, and I don't think he has the votes to, you know, if, if he vetoes it, I bet they could probably override it because this is such a crazy uh, caucus that he's dealing with. But I think just as, as a matter of principle, this is a guy who has stood up over and over again and talked about how important transparency is to him. I don't see how you sign a bill that, that enshrines uh, secrecy. He's not going to cut himself off from ten, fifteen million dollars in an election year. That's, so then he's just then he's a happen. bigger hypocrite it's, if it's about it's just his not money. going to happen. I mean, it's he's not going to veto this bill. He's not going to um, go against his own caucus on on something like this. There are other fights he may choose, but he, I don't think he's going to choose this. So one. then, so then all the stuff he said when he ran about being transparent and being open and 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 all that stuff then it was nothing it was it, it, yeah, it was know, it a, was campaign uh, a lot flaw. of that going around steve you probably <laughs> spent some time talking to the president all right so let me so let me ask you this if you think that that this is such a huge issue for him and going back on things that he said do you think this is going to resonate with voters at all i don't know i mean it, we're a year from the election uh, you know the, the 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 choice voters will have to make in november is between Rick Snyder and somebody else. And I, I always think that that's the choice they're making. They're not really thinking about what did you do two years ago, three years ago. It's very hard to, to, to make uh, a campaign about those things. But I, I'll tell you this, we will be reminding voters throughout the year of the, of the various ways in which this governor has said one thing and done another, which is a disappointment. It doesn't mean uh, he's been a bad governor. I think he's been uh, on balance a pretty decent uh, uh, leader of the state. But this is a guy who has a problem with uh, promising one thing and doing another, and that's it's disappointing. Well, and the guy he'll be running against will be stuffing his campaign with that same sort of money, with unlimited un and unaccounted for union funds and what have you. There are no pure candidates in this thing. There are no clean, clean hands in, a in this th thing. There's and a difference between a candidate who stands up and says, I am different. Uh, Rick Snyder, four years ago, said over and over again how much uh, he Which was going to do hasn't things differently. Stood up and said that. Well, I, hope and change. I don't think. I don't I mean, think. Come on. Uh, but this was a specific uh, promise about transparency and openness and uh, the lack of secrecy. And I think uh, to, to to just sort of abandon that the way he is here because he's got this crazy caucus to deal with shows nothing weakness. Do, this has nothing to do with the crazy caucus. This is a caucus. Okay, now you guys have said governor, crazy caucus. By the way, three, I have three no, times he now. Said it. I'm saying you want to see crazy caucus? Look at Gretchen Whitmer and the Senate Democrats. Democrats for well, there's only 12 Democrats. They have no power to do anything. This is They have nothing to do with it. That, that's because they are so outside the mainstream and have set themselves up well, they're as a bunch the of maps screamers. that have been drawn and, by you know, She would rather stand outside the Capitol and shout at it than go in and accept an invitation to work with the governor to help craft legislation. That invitation has been extended many times, and she would rather stand out and shout at the dome. Well, all right, let, let me let me bring it right back uh, mm -hmm. right back around. Is is the last look at here at this campaign finance bill? How is this going to affect the election next year? Well, I mean, again, it's it, it's in, in about terms of the, how much money is spent. It, in it's this not state. about the amount of money. It's about how much money we can account for. It's about how much money we know where it comes from and and who's spending it and why. Uh, this could have changed the face of, of that next year significantly. It could have given us a much clearer picture of of who's behind these campaigns. All right. Well, we're going to switch gears here for a moment. It seems that some decisions have been made about what Mayor-elect Mike Duggan will be able to do once in office. So we've been talking about this the last couple of weeks, just what exact role mm -hmm. will Mike Duggan play? And now we're getting a, a sense of uh, what it's going to look like when he takes office in January. Yeah, they had an announcement um, today uh, after we taped, and it looks like that Duggan is going to serve, in effect, as the chief operating officer. He'll have about two-thirds of city operations. Uh, I think the most notable things are that he won't have the police department. Police department will continue to report directly to um, uh, Kevin Orr, uh, but he will have development, and I think that's a 
a big piece of this because previously we saw uh, more of de the development activity going to be moved out of the city and into the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. Now it's staying with the city and will be run by a um, key, a key Duggan A, Duggan's top fundraiser during the campaign, uh, Tom Lawan Sr. So. Interesting. So what do you think that we're going to see out of this in terms of what he's going to start to do with development? Well, I mean, I think uh, the primary issue in a lot of Detroit right now is land and land use uh, and how you take this this sort of momentum of development that we've seen in downtown and midtown and spread that to other areas. Uh, if you look at other mayors around the country who have who have really made change in their cities, it's been on this front. I mean, this front as well as public safety tend to be the two big big ticket items that uh, that they that they concentrate on. I mean, if you look at Pittsburgh, for example, uh, they had a mayor who had a map in his office uh, of every parcel in the city. Uh, who owned it and whether it was moving in a positive direction or a negative direction. This was to get control of a blight problem that was, you know, a fraction of what we're facing in Detroit. I think uh, this sets Mike Duggan up to to, to try the, some of those same approaches, uh, get control of the land, figure out, uh, you know, which direction it's headed in and find ways to, 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 to change its course. And blight will stay with, will, will be with Duggan and that's a switch. Earlier on, uh, or had wanted to keep his hands on blight because of the amount of money that's going to have to be raised and the bonds that were going to have to be sold to to pay for the demolition. But during this course of six weeks of negotiations, uh, Duggan convinced him to give him blight. And when he was a prosecutor, he had yeah. he had started this fight on on blight, and he feels he can be effective with it. And I think this combination of blight and development will really help him get his hands on what to do with the city and the city's footprint. And also, it, it'll also be keeping track of a lot of those federal funds that are coming in for uh, for demolition. Sure, and you know, the other piece of this is the uh, Detroit Future City Plan, which gives you this tremendous blueprint and we've needed for a long time. Tremendous, long, long term long -term and slightly blueprint. complicated yes. that they start either have to start hacking into. That's or, right, or, and this gives Doug an, an opportunity to be the policy advocate for for that plan. In other words, what are the what are the changes to city government? What are the changes to land use policies and things that that align with that plan uh, and and make it start to really mean something? To yeah. All right. So, what's the relationship, Nolan? What's the relationship between Kevin well, Orr and and Mike Duggan right now? So he was able to convince him. Mike Duggan was able to convince him to give you know to give some things over. I think they um, respect each other, and I think Duggan handled this very smartly in terms of going in. They've been meeting every Thursday for the last six weeks, going in and working this out privately with Duggan. You haven't heard Duggan out stumping around saying, nobody's talking to me, uh, they're not giving me anything to do. He hasn't been making a public case. He's been lobbying or lobbying the governor uh, very quietly, and I think they've come to a, a mutual respect, and I think they're convinced they can work with each other. Public safety, the fact that he doesn't have control over public safety, do you see that as a negative? Uh, I mean, I think he'll see it as a, ne as a negative. Uh, you know, I mean, this is a guy who wants his hands on the, on the wheel. Uh, my understanding is that there were some, some concerns about the impact of decisions he might make in public safety on the other parts of the restructuring, uh, on the on the bankruptcy. Like, what uh, would he? What would he possibly? What would well, he do? Are, I mean, in terms of reassigning officers, mm -hmm. in terms of negotiating contracts that still need to be dealt with in terms of the police, uh, you know, the numbers of, of officers on the streets and things like that, that all affects bigger picture things that I think uh, Kevin Orr was afraid uh, could be could be impacted negatively by, by somebody else having well, control of it, it. It basically came down to one thing. When Kevin Orr hired James Gregg, he told him, you'll work for me as long as I'm here. And he's fulfilling well, that that's promise. Also true. It makes all the sense in the world to put the police department under the new mayor. Uh, but he made that promise, that commitment to James Craig. I wouldn't be surprised as Duggan and Greg work more closely together that um, you might see that shift under Duggan. But I think they they really wanted to see how I Duggan was going to do very, first. Yeah, I think that'll be difficult um, because James Craig, as you as you point out, was hired by Kevin Oren has been saying pretty loudly, you know, I don't work for the new mayor, I work for the emergency manager. Yeah. So what does that mean 
when the emergency manager well, leaves. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, any any job that you have that you're hired by someone and then that person who hires you leaves, I mean, you, you end up having to having to work with that how, person. And, and, you know, James Craig will have to prove himself. If he has made a serious dent in the crime sure, problem, no it's going to be hard for anybody yeah. to dump him. But there was some real concern. I mean, um, Duggan has Ike McKinnon, former chief, yeah. on his transition team, very close to former chief Warren Evans. And there was very, very... Uh, good deal of concern that he would allow those folks to start meddling in what Craig was doing and they didn't want any part of that. Understandable um, and just before we leave the topic of public safety the, there's been another I guess roundup have you seen in the news that they've gone in and um, done a kind of a, a huge arrest of a number of people and, and do you think that that's starting to make an impact there's been now two I think or three. I think this um, is the third one uh, and I think there's a uh, you know a series of these planned it's it's not the solution and you know you hear people throwing rocks at it because oh well it's not going to solve the long-term crime problem but the truth is this is one of the things that you have to be doing people who have warrants uh, have have to fear that the police are going to come pick them up right. and that's what this is about is going to places where you've got lots of people who are wanted and you pick them up and you you, you take them to jail and you got to send a message that you can't get away with crime in Detroit. And right now, the truth is, you can get away with crime in Detroit. And so you've got to get these people, these futures off the street. You've got to enforce warrants. You've got to send a message here that something has changed. And, you know, it, it stands to reason if you've got someone out there who is wanted on a, a crime, particularly a violent crime, if that person's not picked up, the chances of them committing more violent crimes are, are, are pretty great. So if you're going to get a handle on on crime, particularly violent crime, you've got to get the bad guys off the streets. All right. Well, you know, he has been credited with restoring integrity to the mayor's office in Detroit. Now Dave Bing is serving out his last few days as mayor. He plans on taking his first two-week vacation in years when he is done. But what kind of legacy does he leave? And there was a celebration for him uh, this week celebrating uh, his time in office. What kind of legacy does Dave Bing leave, Nolan? I think people say he did the best he could. Um, it wasn't good enough, uh, obviously, by the results. He wrote a sort of farewell piece for us in today's Detroit News, in which he, you know, really put much of the blame on the governor, uh, much of the blame, blame on the way the state has handled cities. So he's still sort of looking for somebody else to point the finger at, and I just don't think he ever really got a handle on the job itself. He never put the right people in place to help him. This was too big a job for any one person. He needed a lot more help than he had in that in that job. What do you think his overall legacy is, Stephen? I mean, I think the biggest thing is the the, the integrity that he brought yes. back to the office, and and that was important given uh, the circumstances under which the previous mayor left. Um, but but I also you know I wrote a piece I don't know six or seven months ago about uh, the things that Dave Bing actually did that I don't think we pay enough attention to or, or give enough credit for. The Kobo Regional Authority, that was one of the first things that happened when he took office. Uh, the, the move to, to, to create an authority for the water, D DWSD, that was uh, something that he accomplished. Detroit Works, which turned out to be Detroit Future, Future City, City, started as a, a Dave Bing initiative. I mean, there's a, there's a long list of things now that, you know, you, you add them all up and they don't, uh, they don't outweigh the city's biggest problems and, and its number one issue, which was finance, uh, which he was unable to, to do very much about. And so that's why we're in the situation we're in. But that doesn't mean that he didn't accomplish uh, an, an, an awful lot and that there are some things that he did that I think, you know, five, ten years down the road will pay much bigger dividends uh, than they have so far. And, and, you know, you want people to remember that he was the one who actually did those things? You know, Nolan, you said you know I, I, that you think that he did the best that he could mm -hmm. under under the circumstances. And I wonder, was there really anyone else out there that could have changed the outcome of the of the city going into bankruptcy? There wasn't at the time, for sure. I mean, and I I don't think Dave Bing or anyone else realized just how how screwed up things were at that time. Kwame Kilpatrick left a real mess. He left a real financial mess. He left a dysfunctional culture at City Hall, it really was an overwhelming challenge. I think Dave Bang would have done better if he would have accepted more of the help that was offered to him. He never really capitalized on the willingness of the business community to come in to help. He had some really um, uh, bad, or not bad, but he, 
he, he picked some of the wrong people in the beginning and they isolated him from um, some good advice and some good people who might have been helpful. No offense to any of your relatives, but I think he could have done better uh, in picking the key people around him in the beginning. You know, he's still a very important and passionate voice mm -hmm. in this city and in sure. this region. So where does Dave Bing go from here? And how do, I guess, how does the region capitalize on perhaps using him again? Or does he say, I'm gonna oh, stay far away for a while? I think he's done, you know, I mean, he he's, 70 years old this year, I believe, just last month. Uh, this is a guy who's had three lifetime careers, you know. Right. I mean, uh, he was a pro basketball player, one of the best ever, uh, was something people don't always remember. Um, uh, you know, he ran a company for a long time, and now he's been mayor. I don't know that, that we have any reasonable expectation for more uh, Dave Bing, I think he's going to spend a lot of time in Hilton Head. Uh, and, I don't think and, Dave's going to sit on the beach. I mean, he said he wants to be engaged in civic activities. He wants to do mentoring uh, of uh, young black males. He wants to have a role somehow in blight. As Steve mentioned, he started that whole Future Cities movement. He'd like to be part of it. Uh, I think if Doug is smart, though, he'll find things for, for um, Dave Bing to do. He can be a powerful voice and um, have some considerable influence still yeah, in powerful, this city. Powerful voice and a passionate one, and uh, we do wish him all the best. Well, it has been one year since right-to-work legislation passed here in Michigan. There were big predictions of what economic impact this could have and what it would do to union memberships. So one year later, where, where's the, was this a fizzle? Well, I think Where's the impact? I think it's not long. It's not long enough, yeah. right? Uh, uh, so, in five years from now, I can ask this question, and we'll be able to we'll be able to list off. Right. Well, I mean, we'll be able to see if it's had any impact or not. Two things have have been true for sure: that that the predictions of both sides of the argument that you know, uh, one that uh, this would open the floodgate of new jobs uh, in Michigan. That didn't. That didn't come true. I mean, the, the 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 reason Michigan is not growing jobs is far more complex than union issues, and especially at this point, given the the, the dramatic drop in union membership overall before uh, right to work. But the other thing that didn't happen is massive, you know, defection of people out of unions that that would hurt, you know, the bottom line of places like the UAW and uh, the MEA. We haven't seen that, and and so. I think we're in sort of a wait and see kind of mode with this. You know, what what will the true impact of it be down the road? Okay, no one. I mean, word. private. It's not going to affect the private sector unions all that much. They were in decline anyway. Um, as the auto industry starts to recover and add jobs, they're going to pick up jobs. I don't think you're going to get a lot of defections in the private sector. A handful. Where it would have the most impact is the public sector uh, unions, and they uh, they. These unions and their cohorts in government and school boards sign these long contract extensions uh, that protect some of these unions from loss of members for 10 years. Um, I think the biggest change it's made gives Michigan another marketing tool. You talk to the people who are going out there and talking to companies, particularly foreign companies, it it's, takes down a fear. It takes down a barrier. Uh, you take a, a company from Germany, manufacturing company, would never locate here because of unions, and even though they're heavily unionized in their, in own, their own country. In their own country. So it takes down uh, another barrier, barrier and, it, and it, it, ta it removes, you know, it gives them a talking point. The state's been a little reluctant to market it. They tried to initially, and the unions all went up and they in arms. It. It's one of those things, do it or don't do it. If you're well, going to do right. it, don't well, be ashamed of it. Yeah, and we've got to... Uh We've got to end it there. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. And guys, Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful holiday. You're wearing your Christmas tie, Nolan. I am. Right? Look what here. This Good tie, hat. that's the Renaissance Center in Santa Claus. And you come from the old Hudson's. I heard that there Nolan doesn't go. celebrate Christmas. I, th I thought he celebrated Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa, right. <laughs> oh. We're going to burn it's a Kwanzaa been a, It's pole. been a great year, guys. <laughs> thanks so much. That is going to wrap it up for my week. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll be back next week How with a look at some of the biggest interviews from the year while we spend some quality time with our family and friends. As always, thanks for supporting my week and Detroit Public TV. For all of us, have a great weekend. See you.